Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization dedicated to peace, economic and social justice, good government, and a clean environment. One way of achieving that mission is listening to experts discuss pressing local, national, and international issues. Before COVID struck, Concerned Citizens met regularly to hear these experts. After COVID arrived, Concerned Citizens turned to Zoom, video recording talks, panels, and debates for later broadcast on this channel. Now that COVID is in remission, our main menu is again in-person meetings. But for those of you unable to join us, Village TV is video recording our in-person speakers for later broadcast on this program. In addition, when the right opportunity comes along, Concerned Citizens Presents will continue to offer the occasional remote speaker. We hope you enjoy today's program. Uh, well, we have a very special speaker tonight. Uh, and Concerned Citizens is pleased to host Professor Mario Barnes this evening, where he'll address critical race theory. In reading his long and impressive vitae, I saw that he was one of the inaugural faculty at UCI Law School in 2009 and instrumental in developing its curriculum and community. But he had already started his career prior to this accomplishment with both an undergraduate and law degree from UC Berkeley and an LLM from the University of Wisconsin. Professor Barnes had served in the US Navy where among other legal duties, he helped in the investigation of the bombing of the USS Cole in Yemen in 2000. He has taught at the University of Miami, the University of Law, um, Wisconsin Law Schools, and is recently returned from the University of Washington Law School where he was dean and leading faculty member. Nationally recognized as a scholar for his research on the legal and social implications of race and gender in several areas. Professor Barnes has also helped launch the Center for Law, Equality, and Race at UCI. We are so lucky to have a, a, a university in our neighborhood like UCI with a faculty with this level of achievement and talent. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Mario Barnes. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. So first I need to thank uh, Barbara Siri for her steadfastness. So when she first reached out to me about speaking, I was on the precipice of traveling all over Europe from basically April uh, through July. And uh, I said to her, well, just contact me when I get back. And boy, the first voice I heard <laughs> on my voicemail when I got back was uh, Barbara reconnecting to ask if I might um, be able to join you. And so I'm so pleased that uh, she was willing to, to stick uh, through it to, to find a time when we could meet. And I'm so um, both honored and privileged um, to be able to be here tonight and to um, share some musings on something I never would have thought would have become a particularly volatile um, or political topic, um, which certainly has. And so um, let's Uh, I always like to start by setting some goals, even if we are in uh, a conversation. And so tonight I have three. So uh, one, first and foremost, I hope to give you an introduction um, and an overview into what critical race theory or CRT is, because probably the oddest thing about the hullabaloo um, that has arisen over CRT in the recent year and a half is before the hullabaloo, not very many people actually had ever heard of it. Um, or could say they knew what it was. I think that it's actually true today as well, but um, uh, outside of the context of the politicization uh, that most people don't know what CRT is. And then I'd actually like to take some time to give you um, a, an overview of the history of sort of response and challenge to CRT because the truth is um, when CRT was developed in the late um, 80s and early 90s, there actually was a significant pushback um, to it in the legal academy, 
uh, premised on some particularly uh, scholarly um, issues that certain jurists um, and scholars raise with it. Um, and I will sort of segue from that into a discussion of the more recent sort of critique uh, over CRT, which has been largely fueled by um, conservative um, political pundits and politicians. And I'd like to end my time by having a conversation and ask about why CRT is perceived as so dangerous, um, especially in light of its goals, which I will hopefully spend some time explaining to you, um, and the fact that it really is an artifact mostly of higher education um, and law schools and not something uh, that was created to um, poison the mind of little children, which is a, at least what some people have been saying. So, let's make sure I'm going it the right way. Okay, so let me step out of the way and say this. So, what is critical race theory? Well, CRT, um, I, I would call it both um, a scholarly movement um, and um, a methodology um, for um, assessing uh, race, racism, and power that um, has primarily uh, been something that was developed in the legal academy, starting with work um, in the 70s and 80s, um, and leading up to a formal development in the late, uh, in late 1989. But if you ask, you know, what is the primary or sort of foundational claim um, of CRT, um, it really is that there is a history of racism in this country um, that is so pervasive um, that it has found its way um, into our mainstream law and society, not necessarily or only through the individual acts of people, but through systems and structures um, which carry forward um, the sort of foundational relationship um, uh, that was founded in this country and, and around slavery um, and early, I would say, policies related to migrants and migration. So essentially, the tenet to, to uh, critical race theory that people are most referring to when they talk about it is that critical race theory is a movement or a philosophy which suggests that when we talk about race in America today, that we have to think about racism and racial discrimination as systemic and structural issues. Now, it also um, has a kind of context um, that is broader than that, and it has spawned a number of theories um, which are specific and individual. But if you're just asking, you know, what is it that crits believe? Crits believe that you cannot talk about race in America today without starting with the tradition of slavery, moving through Reconstruction and Jim Crow, thinking about the segregation that was pervasive in our society, and asking ourselves, even though we've done so much in this country, um, to address that both in our laws um, and in our social norms, um, what remains of the vestiges um, of that racial formation? So, um, most of the um, things you hear about CRT now are the, about the fact that it has a theory that is premised on addressing the white supremacy that came out of the tradition um, of slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation in the US. But that's really only one part of the narrative of CRT. Uh, when CRT was formed, it basically had two prominent critiques. One was that um, our present is leaked to our past through systemic and structural racism. But the second critique was that the civil rights movement, or the traditional um, approach to addressing uh, race in this country had not been particularly successful um, in achieving racial equality. So um, when CRT was formed, it sort of made everybody mad. Uh, on the one hand, it was a kind of articulation that America was not post-racial or had not gotten over the negative effects of race. But on the other hand, it was also a kind of indictment on something that many people held sacrosanct, right? Many people think about the civil rights movement as one of the great social movements um, of this country. And we cannot deny the achievements of things like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But to suggest that that movement was insufficient um, to meet the needs of rising to the goal of something that secured the rights 
pronounced in the Constitution, especially the 14th Amendment, was part of the articulation of CRT. So it, it was, it was you've you got to love the name, it was critical of everybody. <laughs> so so it, was a, it was an equal opportunity critique. So you can see this last line, despite that, what many people describe now of, of CRT has not been something that we think about as social or political, but we largely think about it um, as a tool we use in academia uh, to challenge doctrinal orthodoxy or sort of prescriptions about how we think about um, race, law, and power. Okay, so unlike certain things that sort of, you know, form over time in a kind of non-distinct um, or non-specific way, CRT actually was created in a very particular moment. Um, CRT was created in the summer of 1989 at a convent in Madison, outside of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, how do we know that? Because 27 scholars got together at that point, all who were working on um, scholarship on race and the law, um, and in that moment declared um, themselves critical race theorists, the phrase likely coming from Kimberly Crenshaw, who is the professor at UCLA Law School, um, and Columbia Law School, but um, the moment of its formation is not nearly so important as why it was formed. So why do we get CRT? Um, there are at least three sort of um, things to think about as uh, being uh, germane to the origin story of CRT. First of all, leading up to the creation of CRT, uh, there had been a pretty significant protest Largely at Berkeley and Harvard, there were some also at Wisconsin, um, and other schools where students were protesting both a lack of diversity in the faculty and a lack of diversity um, in the curriculum in law school to include multiple perspectives um, and histories uh, regarding the impact of race on our legal and social structure. And so on the one hand, there was this grassroots movement uh, to diversify law school faculty and curriculum. But second, Prior to um, the sort of critical race move, the critical race theory movement uh, evolving, there was an earlier movement called critical legal studies. Anybody ever heard of CLS? Okay, so <laughs> here is the really um, cheap penny level dime store history lesson um, of CLS. So in uh, academia and legal academia, we have something called American legal realism. Uh, which forms in the sort of um, late 40s and early 50s. And American legal realists um, attacked um, our sort of both curriculum in law schools and our methodology in the legal profession, making the claim um, that we advanced a notion that law was both objective and neutral, when really in truth, law was something that was context specific. So legal realists, so here was the thing. Before the realists, we, we presumed that when judges decided cases, the answer to the case was absolutely a foregone conclusion based on the facts and the application of the law because there was only one right conclusion that could be reached um, based on those things. Yeah, right. So <laughs> the legal realist said, no, unfortunately, the answer basically depends on what that judge had for lunch, um, you know, his political views, um, who, who wins and who loses and who cares about who wins and who loses, and more importantly, politics, right? So the illegal realists, their camp was attempting to paint a different picture um, of law as a profession and um, legal scholarship as being uh, far less certain far more contextual um, than uh, others had claimed it was. So the critical legal studies people arose out of this American legal realism tradition, and they said a couple of things. We agree that law is not nearly um, so neutral and objective as we claim. We also agree that law um, is context specific, and more importantly, they also claim that you had to understand uh, law um, as somehow uh, tied to uh, sort of either sociological or social uh, phenomena, right? So law couldn't be looked at in a vacuum. Vacuum. You had to think, look at other things to include politics, to include social behavior and norms. And so, basically, CLS was a critique of um, of, of law, which started to introduce ideas about racism and sexism and other forms of disadvantage having a significant impact 
uh, on legal outcomes. And so um, for many years, at least from the sort of late 50s up into the earlys, CLS was a home for many people who would later become um, CRT scholars. But what happens in 1987 um, is that the CLS folks have a meeting in LA, and at that meeting in LA, they want to talk about race. Unfortunately, they do two things. They forget to invite women and people of color to be prominent speakers on it. Um, and then secondarily, they don't want to actually have a fully complicated conversation about the way race and gender are affecting life outcome. And the place where they have a huge fissure is one thing that CLS proponents do believe in is they believe in the power of rights. That the, the structure of, of rights within our constitution and our law is a real and protective thing. Whereas many of the people who would later call themselves critical race theorists thought that rights had under-delivered um, as a form of protection and that rights were illusory, right? That rights could be as, as easily taken away as they were granted. See Dobbs, right? Which is this notion of um, uh, there was this now ideological split. So after the meeting in 87, uh, the crits who were there said, we need our own formation. And as Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the people at that first meeting in 89, the person who likely coins the phrase critical race theory said, we saw in that moment a unique confluence of temporal, institutional, and political factors. I think she is saying, in other words, the time was right um, for the birth of a different movement, one that made both race the center of the conversation, and two, invited people from minority perspectives to actually be involved um, in charting a course of understanding the interaction between race, racism, um, and power, both in US society, but also um, in our profession, right? How was law either complicit um, or a tool for potential change um, in these areas? Okay, so we start from this moment in 1989. By the time I got to law school in 1992, CRT is a burgeoning um, field or subfield. It's just starting to be offered as a course in law schools. I actually took um, critical race theory in law school in the um, spring of my last year. So I took it in 1995, and at this time it, it starts being offered um, at many places. Really the issue is whether you have somebody on the faculty um, who can teach it at this time. Um, and it grows from being taught um, at a handful of law schools to being a course that is offered at many law schools across the country um, and ultimately expands into both other fields and the undergraduate world, at least um, in the areas of um, education and some of the humanities, critical race theory has taken um, a foothold, and it is true in some undergraduate majors um, that they offer either a CRT course um, or a theory course that includes or is informed by um, CRT. CRT has not just become commonplace in law school and found its way into undergraduate curricular, it has also become a bit of an international phenomena. You can now find international volumes um, that incorporate either CRT proper or ideas from CRT, um, mostly in Europe um, and in, in Asia. Um, and much like CRT turned out to be a breakaway movement uh, from critical legal studies, um, uh, there have been other movements that have come after CRT um, which have expanded and complicated um, I think the or foundational tenets or doctrines of CRT. So um, if you, it, presently we have Lat crit, which is Latina, Latino critical theory. Um, we have the fem crits, which are um, feminist and critical legal scholars. Um, we have class crits who focus on socioeconomic class. Um, that last group there, ECRT, um, is empirical methods in critical race theory. And these are people who focus on um, using social science methods um, and CRT or, or using data sets um, as a, a tool to enhance the assessment um, of CRT, but also projecting critical theory um, into social science method. Um, I didn't, it's not up there, but there is also um, uh, an Asian American critical theory. Um, and they all add something different. The, what they attempt to do um, is expand out from the fun, foundational concepts that we're gonna see on the, the next slide, because one of the things that quickly became 
um, associated with critical theory and its initial formation was that the discussion of race and CRT initially focused primarily on what we call the black-white binary, which is race as a problem largely historically framed um, around issues and conflict between blacks and whites when we understand that race is a broader construction. Um, there are many more groups um, than African Americans. And so um, even though the CRT sort of um, family started to expand to address these problems, as it grew, groups decided that CRT itself was not particularly um, detailed enough in its explication of the problems um, of certain other groups, and they expanded out um, to create other kind of subfields um, of study. Now, it's interesting, you don't hear anybody complaining about LACRIT or ACRT, because what you need to politicize something um, is for it to have just enough, um, I think, familiarity with just a large enough group of people um, for it to take off, and I think some of these subgroups are not nearly as well known um, outside legal academia. This bottom point, however, is one that becomes important before we get to the slides about the critique of CRT, which is, for the most part, CRT is not something that is taught in primary or secondary schools in the US. It certainly is not taught as a whole course. Um, it may be introduced as an idea or maybe used as a tool to inform certain ideals. For instance, anytime anybody talks about structural or systemic racism, they may say, and this is a tenet of critical race theory, right? Or it is the primary or principal tenet um, of CRT. That does not mean they are teaching children critical race theory. It means they are making a claim about the origin um, of the material they're sharing. But there, I, I mean, I, I had a research assistant look at like five different states, um, you know, and to, to look whether they could find an actual course or curriculum looking at in each state, you know, seven to 10 school districts, and we couldn't find one whole dedicated course. We found a couple of mentions, and it wasn't uh, you know, a endorsed at the level of the school board. It was, you know, a subsection of someone's individual syllabus. So before we start talking about the danger to the children, you should know this is not something um, that is primarily taught before you get to law school. You might have an opportunity, about 10 to 15 percent of my students have been introduced to it um, before they come to law school. So it is basically um, a, a theory and a curriculum uh, for law school and certain um, undergraduate programs and now other graduate programs. But I, I make this point because this seems to be the incredible flashpoint um, that has arisen for the backlash against CRT. Okay, so other than what I've told you about this commitment to explicating structural and systemic racism, what else do we consider to be CRT? Well, there's not one particular perspective that makes some work CRT or not, the work just has to explore connections between race and power. Um, it typically does so from the, um, from the vantage point of understanding the significance of historical um, uh, events and relationships. But over time, CRT has amassed um, a set of theories for which they have now become uh, theories that people think of as either germinal, foundational, or essential um, to uh, the scholarly movement. And I'll talk a little bit um, about uh, some of these. I think some of them will be familiar to you. Um, so one of the most prominent critical race theorists is a man named Derek Bell. Derek Bell was the first African-American tenured member of the Harvard Law Faculty. Um, Derek Bell is famous for two things. One, being the first black man to be tenured at Harvard, the thing is probably second most famous for is being har fired from Harvard for refusing to come back to teach until they hired a black woman. Um, they basically refused to hire one and then when he wouldn't return, um, they fired him and detenured him. He ended up okay and NYU invited him to become uh, a permanent member of the faculty until he passed away. But Derek Bell was a crit before CRT existed, meaning before CRT was so named, um, he engaged in scholarship, which many people now think is foundational to CRT. So I have there Derek Bell's two most famous theories. The first is the theory of entrance convergence. 
So what entrance convergence says is Derek Bell, looking at the Brown versus Board of Education case, determined that you, you didn't get racial progress or racial advance just out of the kindness of people's heart. Um, what he suggested is the only times you got significant racial transformation or racial advance for minorities to include blacks was when there was also some advantage for the larger society or whites. Hence, entrance convergence, right? There has to be something good in it um, for more than one party. And so, so when you look at Brown versus Board of Education, he says, well, yeah, you get desegregated schools, which gives educational um, access and opportunity um, to mostly two kids in the South, black kids in the South, who are locked out. But he said, at the same time, there are two significant um, societal advantages that have nothing to do with black people. Um, one is that at this time, the American society um, is being subject to a critique um, by its detractors and enemies claiming that our experiment in democracy is failing because we are not living up to our constitutional goals for true equality and justice. So in some ways, the Brown versus Board decision is a pushback against what develops into the Cold War critique of the United States. Secondarily, um, Bell suggests that um, at the moment at which Brown arises, you now have this severe um, problem of military shortages, mostly caused by the fact that um, uh, African and Amer Americans and others who served during World War II have come back to a country that is not delivering on the promise of full equality they expected, um, and so they are becoming disenfranchised and disenchanted at a time where we continue to need um, soldiers and sailors for the Korean conflict. And so one of the ways to reconvince these um, folks that the American dream includes them um, is to have a significant political um, or judicial advance which reconfirms the commitment um, to equality. So he says in the end, yes, there was a, the benefit of desegregation, but there are all the, the other benefits um, that adhered to the society itself, to the government. Um, and later in his work, he just becomes much more explicit, which is you cannot um, uh, in this country get a significant advance that helps minorities unless there is an equivalent or significant advance that helps others. So that becomes the concept of entrance convergence. Um, his other theory is much less hopeful. His other theory is the permanent of racism, and it, he introduces it in a book that comes out in the late, eight, no, the early 90s called Faces at the Bottom of the Whale. Um, and his book suggests that we have gone about addressing systemic and structural racism all wrong because for years what we've tried to do is correct or overcome racism in this country. He says that's the wrong idea. We would do better to just accept the fact that racism is permanent. If we started from the premise that racism is permanent and that you can't win over the hearts and minds of everybody to embrace equality um, and justice for others, that then maybe you might shift your policies um, to be more pragmatic um, and simply at attempt to, to uh, achieve more instrumental goals. And so again, um, I don't think Critz had any particular problem with it, but when the book came out, people were outraged, right? How can you say we should just accept, you know, our whole idea is built on the hopeful notion that we can eradicate this. And he said, well, we've been trying to eradicate it for generations with no luck. Um, and the reason is because um, there are advantages in having a system of racial spoils that not everybody is ever going to get on board uh, with giving up. So why don't we just accept that we can't get rid of racism, but we might be able to structure better solutions, understanding it as permanent. So those are the two theories most associated with Derrick Bell. There are also two theories that if you read or take a CRT class like the one I teach, um, they certainly um, are foundational concepts. Other concepts that come out of the, the CRT sort of oeuvre, implicit bias. Now I think how many people have heard of implicit bias, also called unconscious bias? Okay, there's a great website that Harvard runs. Um, it's called Project Implicit. You can go to this website at Harvard and it, you can take a test and what implicit bias tries to suggest to you is if you ask people if they're racist, they'll tell you, I'm not. Most of them are honestly 
stating what they believe about themselves, right? You ask me if I'm not, I'm not racist. Are you kidding? Look at me. No, I'm not racist. But what, you, what happens is what you're speaking of is your conscious beliefs and thoughts. You're not, you're not addressing the way in which you are socialized to associate certain char characteristics with certain people. And in America, we're often socialized to a certain, to, um, to, to stereotype people uh, along racial lines. And we may not explicitly acknowledge that, but the whole point of implicit bias testing is to measure implicitly um, whether you have some deficit. And so what Project Implicit actually does, all it does is it takes two things, one black, one white, ask you to, to associate them with goodness and badness. So, so they'll be like, how capable are you associating a black thing with something good? Okay, and you're like, okay, I can do it. And you're doing it, and you're matching, you're matching, you're matching. What it does is it measures the time delay that it takes you to do the association. What you will find is when you get your result, what? Um, you may not be racist in your heart, but your mind is doing something that you apparently are unaware of. When I will just tell you, I took the test, turns out I'm a little bit racist. Um, and I said to my, how is that possible? Well, because it's merely an association of people to a trait where I am socialized like everybody else in the society, where I'm affected by the same stereotypes. Anybody seen the musical Avenue Q? Yeah, so Gary Coleman sings the song, everybody's a little bit racist sometimes. And so the whole point is not to indict people. The whole point is to show you that you can have unconsciously some limits that we don't understand um, as represented in our explicit views. Um, and the former dean of UCI did a wonderful police study um, on this. She did some, a study, um, I think it's in Minnesota, on something called hit rates. All she did was look at arrest and look at the race of those arrested. And what she, she asked is, um, in which cases did the police actually find some evidence that a crime was being committed? And what she found is when the police stopped whites, there were high rates of actually finding criminal contraband. But when the police stopped blacks, there was very low rates of finding criminal contraband. And so what they, what they did was constructed something they called the hit rate, right? The hit rate was the amount of times that you found some criminal contraband when you stopped someone. And what they suggested to the police is, what, what's happening is when you stop whites, you're actually using your police training to decide that people are engaged in conduct which is evocative of, of doing something suspicious or particularly um, out of the ordinary that you would associate with criminality. Whereas with blacks, you are mostly stopping them based on race. So what you can actually do is present them the data on their hit rates and then train them to use the same types of tools um, to stop blacks that they use to stop whites. And so the whole point of suggesting, and I would suggest that Dean Richardson's study on hit rates is a sort of offshoot of Charles Lawrence's study on implicit bias. All you're showing people is you don't necessarily um, have conscious knowledge of the thing that's informing particular um, social choices. And it could be that race is operating in ways that you're unaware of. And so when we talk about implicit bias, that's what we're talking about. One of the areas in which I write is voice, counter-narrative, and storytelling. And voice, counter-narrative, and storytelling is, is to make the suggestion that um, in law, it is not just important to know what happened. Um, it is as important to know who it happened to. Um, meaning that how we think about whether somebody is likely to be guilty, whether somebody is actually someone um, who is a criminal or who should be um, you know, stopped for a particular reason is often a function of things like what neighborhood you live in, um, how you dress, your race, your gender, um, any number of factors that are not um, just objective and neutral. And so this whole body of work suggests that um, people have a story to tell about their um, legal interactions that are informed by their social identity. So one of my first articles I ever wrote was called um, Black Women's Stories in the, Crim in the Criminal Law. And it looked at the ways in which the court papers describe um, uh, black women and their conduct versus the ways in which um, the women themselves may have 
describe what happened to them, and then bringing together data from um, newspaper articles and other sources to ask the question whether the law itself um, was using stereotypes as a means um, to associate uh, people of particular races and gender um, with guilt. And the point was, um, we cannot say that the law is one size fits all, and it's important for people to be able to articulate from their own perspective, including one that includes, um, you know, uh, how they operated in the world, informed by race, gender, class, um, sexuality, religion, and that it should be important for the law to be responsive to claims that not everybody gets treated the same. It created a whole uproar um, by suggesting that law worked differently um, for different people, but I think that's borne out um, in the data. The, the last three theories are ones that are, are fairly prominent in the current literature. Um, I talked to, with the group um, at dinner about intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw at UCLA and Columbia is widely credited with introducing the ideal of intersectionality, um, which is that, you know, it, it is wrong to think um, about a person based on only one element of their identity, um, their gender or their race or their sexuality or their class. Her whole concept was uh, we are people who exist at the intersection of multiple social identity factors. So my race and my gender and my class and these things. And the problem was um, anti-discrimination law early on forced people to choose um, one characteristic upon which they had been discriminated. So were you discriminated because you were black or because you were a woman? And there wasn't this understanding that there could be the experience of being a black woman um, where it was both race and gender that informed um, while you were treated in a particular way. So this takes hold, um, it's probably one of the theories that has been expo exported outside of critical race theory, but the whole notion of it is um, uh, we should think of whole, more holistically about how bases of discrimination um, overlap um, and reinforce each other. Um, the social construction of race um, I'm particularly um, interested in is the uh, framing of the concept that we are not biologically distinct from each other. We are not. We may look different, <laughs> um, but we are not, bio at the level of biology, we are not different. There is no true race, right? There are not people who are white or black or yellow or red or anything. The truth is biologically, we're all the same. Race is an artifice. It's a social construction. It's something we made up to create divisions between people. And unfortunately, it's something that laws have been used to enforce. You can also use laws to tear down those divisions, but the whole concept of somehow race is real um, is just from a biological perspective wrong. Race is something we created socially for purposes that have to do um, with both social norms, but also with theories of um, kinds of, you know, the, um, what I would suggest is determining who has access to which societal resources. I mean, that's the whole point of it, right? To subcategorize in ways um, that create privilege for some and disadvantage for others, but it's not real. And then finally, um, this is Cheryl Harris at UCLA. Developed this theory, it's been pretty much co-opted internationally, mostly by indigenous peoples. This theory of whiteness as property. Um, and Cheryl's theory is that race privilege is a real thing and you can gain so many advantages depending on your race that uh, over time it operates like a property interest. Like it operates at the level um, of providing you a sort of permanent advantage that we would see similar to you know, the value of owning a property. Um, and again, these are not exhaustive, but these are the kinds of things that have become the content uh, of critical race theory over time. And it, as you might imagine, not something you could teach easily to a seven-year-old. You know, my students struggle <laughs> with some of this work. Certainly some college students do. So this is really advanced kind of thinking um, about you know, race, racism, and power. It taught properly probably to, to undergraduate students, but certainly to law students, taught mostly to complicate our understanding um, of what we often uh, think of as oversimplified, oversimplified explanations of how race works. Okay, so here's what happens. 
those folks come out in 1989 and say, this is who we are. Over time, they start developing this body of theory. And very early on, um, there's pushback, mostly from legal scholars um, and jurists. And here's what they don't like. They don't like the fact that critical race theorists, like critical legal studies people, are saying that law is not objective and neutral. It absolutely, so Judge Posner, famous judge from the Seventh Circuit, he hates critical race theory. He's written like six articles against it saying, what are those people talking about? I am a judge, you know, I, I hand down my decisions like manna from the heavens. They are, was prescribed in the law, and so, so they don't like that. They also don't like the fact that if you read most critical race theory, it says that race informs life outcomes, meaning you are more likely um, statistically to have certain types of issues in education, um, in employment, and in income, and in health based on race. They didn't like that because they say that is a critique of meritocracy and undermines the, the notion that everybody gets what they work for. And I actually get, think that a lot of people get what they work for, but if you work for things and were born to a family with millions of dollars, you might do a little better. So, meritocracy might be about your hard work, but it might be about your daddy leaving you millions for real estate, and even though you're really unsuccessful at um, it yourself, you can become president. So, the notion was they didn't like the suggestion that there was a critique of merit. Um, and they also didn't like the suggestion, that yeah, question? Uh, uh, questions to later. It, well, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions, and we'll have a mic so everybody can hear your questions. Thank you. Okay. So they they also don't like this claim. Essentially, um, the, remember I told the whole notion of narrative voice perspective. They don't like this sort of claim that um, you know minorities or blacks or Latinos or any person would have a different experience in the law. Like, no, everybody gets treated the same, whatever that is, um, and there isn't any notion of different outcome except for, you know, in people's conduct, not in their status based on race. And the claim was that to think otherwise is to be a radical multiculturalist who's playing identity politics, right? Which is this claim is you are people for whom you don't like what's happened to you in life, and you're making a claim that it's you know, race, gender, other things that have dictated this, um, where the critique, at least at this time from, the, um, uh, from academics, was that there wasn't data to bear that out. So there is this kind of back and forth for about five to seven years between the crits um, and their critics, and there are several books um, uh, on these topics, and ultimately, um, the critique from within academia sort of dissipates. Um, and the reason I actually think it dissipates is because you don't have to agree with um, all of the, the theories have come out of CRT. You don't have to agree with things like voice or, or the critique of merit. But I will say this, nobody has undermined the basic critique. The basic critique is that um, the history of racism in this country has reproduced or manifested itself in structural and systemic ways. Uh, and that's just, I don't know that that's even all that incendiary, right, to, to think about that. But so over time, you can like or not like any particular critical piece, but there was no need anymore for any more. This was a part of the time in the law school world when we had said we had the culture wars going on. But they, they sort of dissipated because the, the primary claim was never refuted. Um, and each of these turned out to be sort of a response to one individual crit's work or idea. That, however, is a very different critique than the one that arose um, within the last two years. The previous critique that in the early 90s was a scholarly critique. It was about um, uh, the crit's theory of law and about their ideas about the relationship between 
um, uh, sort of race, racism, and power within the context um, of law itself and in law schools, but it wasn't meant to fuel um, a larger political debate um, or to start a kind of um, a grassroots campaign against CRT, um, mostly as I suggested to you, CRT has taken hold in most law schools and some undergraduate programs. But, so this is an interesting story in what happens um, in the recent attacks. So how this all starts is there is one guy, um, Chris Rufo. Chris Rufo, he used to make documentary films like in Mongolia or something. Uh, he did some film on the Uyghurs in China and he did some other films and then he came back to Seattle and he got a grant from a um, conservative think tank and he was going to do some work on diversity programs and training. So he started going to diversity training programs and what he realized was that the kinds of things they were teaching in the diversity program uh, were problematic. Um, and what he said, there was two things at least. He thought that the programming was essentializing people, which is making people their race, their gender, um, their sexuality, and he also thought um, that the sort of ideas coming out in these trainings were, were built on Marxist philosophies or somehow um, uh, anti-democratic um, in their norms. And so he starts doing research on the training materials and starts coming across critical race theory and makes the claim that the problem with these trainings is that they are informed with principles from CRT. And so he m sort of moves away from conversations about diversity training and moves towards conversations about the dangers of CRT. And then what he does is uh, he's so concerned that he writes several articles about this, but he also reaches out to um, uh, sort of particular members of political parties and um, their proponents and starts suggesting that CRT is not contained um, to the world of diversity trainers, that the principles and foundations of CRT have crept in uh, to every element of society, including um, schooling for primary and secondary children. And while it's true that they are not teaching critical race theory courses proper, much like the diversity training, these ideas in CRT um, are caking hold. And one of the examples um, is in this um, quote from the Alliance for Defending Freedom. This is the kind of claim they're making about what children are being taught. A radical, a radical ideology teaching children they are oppressed or an oppressor, good or bad, based solely on the color of their skin and that their race determines their life outcomes. And so there, you get this image um, of like six-year-olds sitting there and you say, are you the oppressed or the oppressor? I mean, it, it sort of reminds me of the Clark Doll studies, right, that were used in um, uh, Brown versus Board of Ed, which is the good doll, which is the bad one, which is the pretty doll. And so the point was, it starts to spread a narrative which no one is certain is actually true. Like I said, I started doing some research and found it was very unlikely that CRT proper was being taught, and I couldn't even find explicit examples where the references teachers were using called it critical race theory. They might have talked about structural or systemic racism, but um, it starts getting, taking hold in 2020, 2021, to the point that by the time we get to fall 2021, um, uh, from the fall 2020, that the then president has come up with a new policy regarding training on, on gender and race discrimination or stereotyping, um, Executive Order 13950, and he refers to CD, uh, CRT as an ideology that spreads a pernicious and false belief that America is irredeemably racist and sexist. Um, and so at this point, the bandwagon uh, is open for folks to jump on. And I have about 40 statements from um, different levels of politicians across the country criticizing CRT, largely in Texas, um, Florida, in the middle of the country. My favorite is the politicians who said, we really got to stop this CRT. And the reporter will say, well, what is it? Well, I'm not sure what it is, but it's incredibly dangerous. 
You know, it's like, you know, the old case with pornography. It's, <laughs> we know it when we see it. Um, so uh, by the time we get to 2021, we have 22 states that have introduced legislation to restrict CRT, um, with some states successfully banning it from their curricula. I, I, I respond to that as not understanding it, um, but the part that happens next is more dangerous, certainly in terms of the locality of the inquiry and um, the importance of um, institutions of higher, higher education um, having the ability to have robust free speech paradigms, which is then a number of state legislatures start sending notices to their universities, um, asking them to give them data on any courses mentioning CRT um, and any um, professors teaching or writing in the area. Um, I have one friend who was the dean of a Midwest law school who had to go to great lengths to try to protect um, a few members of her faculty. Ultimately, she decided to step down um, and leave that school and go to another one because her sense was she would not be able to protect them from the sort of punishment that would come from the state if they continued to teach or writing in those areas. That is not what the First Amendment is meant about. That is not what educational um, institutions are about. We believe in speech. We believe in free speech. We believe that if you think that the ideals are dangerous, then what you need to do is introduce counter-narrative um, to rebut them, not to silence the people who are making the arguments. But um, it's, you know, state schools are, are subject um, uh, to uh, state legislatures, and if you don't comply, the thing they most threaten, your funding. So, okay. So, the, in responding to this kind of backlash um, that arose and has been going on for the last two and a half years, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund described CRT has now been co-opted by opponents as the catch-all and rallying cry to silence any discussions about systemic racism. So their notion is it's not about the, the various theories I, I pointed out to you. It's about using CRT um, as, you know, the descriptor for all of the conversations um, about race that we don't wish to have, which allege there's some systemic impact um, of historical racism. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw herself responded to the attacks, says it's a manufactured critique arising as backlash to the national racial reckoning that followed the murder of George Floyd. So many scholars believe that post-George Floyd, we had an important moment in this country where many people who had never really thought about um, the expanse of racism and how it might operate in contexts like police encounters or the criminal justice system were confronted firsthand with a visual uh, which suggested that we are not all living the same lives and that who you are very much dictated what your experience might be, so much so that many people who had never been willing to think about police reform, racial reform, were more open to it. And so she thinks that while Rufo may have just wanted to take his sort of, you know, moment of uh, discovery and expand it into the sort of political domain, that once it got there, it became a way to push back um, against what was this kind of national reform moment um, after George Floyd. And then I actually like, this is from the Brookings Institute, um, probably describes my own kind of thought on how this is being used. He said, Fox News has mentioned critical race theory 1,300 times in less than four months. Why? Because CRT has become a new bogeyman for people unwilling to acknowledge our country's racist history and how it impacts our present. Again, this is the thing that the academics didn't actually take on because they thought in some ways that might be viewed as a truism. Um, but it just becomes the very thing um, that is, I think, fueling, or at least partially fueling, um, the current moment of uh, politicization. Okay, we're at the end. So my thing is, if we think about assessing, I don't find um, CRT particularly dangerous. Others of you might, I allow for that. Um, but my question is, for people who think there might be danger, if, is it somehow untruthful um, to speak of racism in the U.S. as um, a structural issue? Like, which is to say, do we only, are we only allowed to have conversation about racism that looks at an individual um, discriminator and say, that person right there, that person is the one person who's the problem, um, and you just, you know, handle that person or those few people, get the few people left in the Ku Klux Klan and we'll all be good. Um, 
I think that's not the right approach. And so is it harmful for individuals to engage in conversations that describe societal benefits of race, class, and gender privilege? I have gender privilege. I know I have gender privilege. I don't try to deny it. Um, it doesn't mean that um, somehow it's not true that in other areas um, uh, I might have challenge, but we could all sort of go through a list of things and think about place. I also have class privilege. You can look at places where there are just things where you have advantage and other places where you don't. Is there a problem to speak about this thing? Because one of the um, things that conservatives have said about CRT is um, it makes um, white people feel bad about being white because it makes them feel personally responsible for racism today that they had no part in. And my sense is that's actually not what the goal of CRT is. CRT doesn't care that anybody feels bad. We don't care. <laughs> what we would like is people to acknowledge that the system um, is working in a way um, in which the outcomes are problematic. And whether a particular individual um, is responsible for that is not a particular helpful orientation for discussing it. What we have to ask is, how do we create um, um, different outcomes more consistent with what I hope um, uh, we believe um, is, a, is a better outcome. And then, um, for my own center, um, right, I say this, you know, we talk of, my whole goal with the center is to, to provide a safe environment for our students to have frank discussions um, about race and to query how law can be a tool for limiting racial inequality. At times we talk about theories from CRT, other times we don't, but my question is if you take these kind of attacks to their logical end, that we should not be allowing students uh, this tool to speak about these things. Um, is that a helpful outcome? Is this what we think uh, will produce a better um, situation? And then finally, this is the last side. Um, and, and this is the, what I do with my students all the time. So one problem with the past and current critiques of CRT is that they have not offered an, an ostensibly better approach for meaningfully addressing ongoing race and sex-based discrimination. What do, if we want a different theory, fine. It can be dissimilar from CRT, but how is it that we go about creating an adventure, intervention that addresses lingering racial and gender inequality? How would the components work if we're honestly engaging these issues? Um, and what ways would they be vastly different from the critique um, in CRT? Um, is there a way to address entrenched racism or systematic bias without having people um, feel at least marginally like it's a claim about personal responsibility. That's not what I think it is, but could you, I don't know that there's a way to eliminate that. So my goal is to, to say this. I don't think the politicization is really about CRT. I think the politicization um, is, is both um, a kind of, um, a, I agree with the bogeyman theory of this is the thing we will talk about instead of talking about all the things that are matter. But I also think um, it's, it's an easy attack point because race is something that makes people feel uncomfortable. Having a kind of theory out there that discusses it in these terms, which are more radical than um, previous ways of thinking about it, um, is something that makes people feel uncomfortable. And to the extent that discomfort exists, you can get a number of people to be responsive to um, wanting to ensure we're not endangering children. I want to ensure we're not creating um, uh, blame in ways that we shouldn't. My own belief is I don't need anybody to feel personally responsible. I need people who are willing to see the facts in the world as they are and ask questions about are there ways that we can contribute to, um, a, prog uh, to a program um, or a process that creates better outcomes for more people. Okay, we are ready for questions.